Well, hello, everyone. My name is Lee Nichols, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Associate Publisher of Hydrocarbon Processing and Gas Processing and LNG Publications. I'd like to welcome all of you to another installment of Hydrocarbon Processing's Refined View. Now, today we got a very special guest joining us, Bill Cunningham, who's the Director of Business Development, Integrated Solutions for Siemens Water Solutions. Today, we're going to be discussing his article, which was titled, Meeting Strict Government Standards for Wastewater Reuse and Improved Water Quality. Now, this article appeared in the April issue of Hydrocarbon Processing Magazine. It is open access, so I highly recommend you take a look at it. Uh, it's a very interesting case study regarding some work that Siemens conducted at Sinopec's Ankeen Refinery to adhere to new environmental regulations. So for this segment, we're actually going to be taking a deeper dive into the project Siemens successfully completed at the Ankeen Refinery, the technology that made it possible, and of course, how it can be applied. So first off, I would like to welcome in Bill Cunningham. So Bill, how are you doing today? Uh, very well, Lee. Thank you very much for having me there today. Oh, ac excellent. Yeah, first, we really, really want to thank you for your time to discuss this important topic. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Now, first, for those that may not be familiar with your article, um, can you briefly summarize Siemens' project history at the Sinopec Ankeen Refinery? Because from my understanding, um, from reading the article, there's two projects. One, chemical oxidation demand, or COP, reduction, which was followed by total nitrogen control to comply with new discharge standards. So can you just kind of uh, go through some of the details of the projects y'all completed there? Yes, surely. Um, and understand, too, that there's a driver behind these projects. It, uh, the project is located in mainland China. And uh, China, as a, um, uh, as a government policy for their planning and ec economic planning, they run five-year programs, five-year planning. So the first five-year plan that, that uh, affected the project was the plan from uh, 2014 to 2019. So that five-year plan addressed some very, very stringent uh, effluent requirements for the refinery and petrochemical industry. So Siemens Water Solutions was uh, retained by the Sinopec uh, state-run oil company uh, to devise a treatment system for treating the refinery wastewaters. And there were two, actually, two treatment plants that Siemens provided. The first was for an oily, what's characterized as oily wastewater. It's the general wastewaters produced by refining operations. And that water uh, is, uh, the, the company chose to reuse and repurpose that water after treatment. And that was because the five-year plan limited the amount of water that the refinery could extract from the local uh, river. And that's called the Yangtze River. And we'll get into that a little bit later here. But um, so anyway, Siemens designed a treatment system for the oily water and as well as another system for the salty waters. And these are more high uh, total dissolved solids containing waters, more difficult to treat. And those waters then would meet the strict discharge standards for discharge back into the Yangtze River. So that was the first treatment system. Of course, then there was the second five-year plan. And in that second five-year plan, uh, the uh, additional treatment standards were imposed, and that was for the nitrogen, the ammonia-containing uh, pollutants in that water. So Siemens then uh, partnered with Sinopac and designed some retrofits, some very interesting retrofits for this treatment system, both treatment systems, to meet these new discharge standards for nitrogen, total nitrogen control. Excellent. So now let's talk about PACT and WAR. So I'm kind of curious, what are some of the more unique features of PACT or, or powdered activated carbon treatment and of course, war, wet air regeneration. Uh, this technology, and why was that ideally suited for the Ankeen project? Uh, and that's a good question. And, and so for industrial wastewaters, the, those, a majority of these industrial wastewaters contained organic compounds. And organic compounds are problematic if you're going to discharge this water into a receiving water body, a stream or a bay, um, and, uh, and, and so the organics need to be removed. And most of the time, most of the time, a biological wastewater treatment process is deployed to remove these organics. Now, as you go through the spectrum of the industrial sector world, there's a variety of organic compounds that are going to be contained in this wastewater. And many of them, uh, and most of them, in fact, are biodegradable, but there is a fraction that is non-biodegradable. 
And what what in 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 China, what the state government was doing was was developing greater and greater uh, um, effluent treatment requirements to protect their water quality of of in this case the Yangtze River. And so, in order to meet these standards, biological treatment alone would not be adequate to achieve the standards. So you you have essentially two choices: you can polish the effluent, clean it up further after biological treatment with granular activated carbon. Granular activated carbon is used in water treatment for drinking water control, as well as in wastewater. But the amount of carbon that would have to be used, granular activated carbon that would have to be used every day would exceed 15 tons of granular activated carbon per day. So that was, is, it, it's an unmanageable quantity of carbon to, to, uh, that would have to be used to achieve these new effluent limits. So a second choice is powdered activated carbon. Powdered activated carbon can be added directly into the bioreactor, and you get this synergy, synergism that occurs. You get simultaneous biological treatment for the biodegradable organics, as well as physical absorption of those remaining contaminants onto the carbon. And even though you have the same 15 tons a day cycling through the treatment plant in those bioreactors, you now have the ability, because it's powdered form, in the daily production of biomass and, and carbon addition, you could take that stream and regenerate the carbon. And that's called the wet air regeneration process. So we can take the waste product of powdered activated carbon with the excess biomass and run it through the Siemens wet air regeneration technology and regenerate and reuse up to 95% of that powdered activated carbon. Excellent. So then I'm kind of curious, so what other industrial wastewater treatment project types uh, would you consider PAC to be applicable for? Well, it's, it's, um, it's pretty, it has a pretty wide spectrum of, of industrial processes that it can be used at. The, um, the primary benefit here is that there is a fraction of this COD, the chemical oxygen demand, which is derived from organic compounds. There's a, a fraction of those that are not biodegradable or very uh, slowly biodegradable or just resistant to biodegradability. And so um, typical uh, applications, uh, in addition to oil and gas, we'll find even in the steelmaking industry. Uh, we'll find it in pharmaceuticals. We'll find it in textile. Um, and, uh, and, and we can find it in the general chemical industry, coal to chemical and other synthetic organic uh, chemical uh, industry. So it's a broad spectrum. As long as those compounds can absorb to, to carbon, uh, and most will, um, we can take care of very, very high efficiency requirements uh, in, in wastewater treatment in, in, in the industrial sectors. So then it leads to my next question then is the industrial influent treatment regulations in China, of course, where, this, where, this, where these projects were completed, how do those compare to, let's say, other parts of the world for similar applications? Well, interesting, um, and, and this has all come about in the last 10 years. China is leading that effort in, in promulgating uh, greater and greater effluent limitation uh, requirements placed on industry, and, there, and, there, and there's a reason behind that. Uh, there has been this rapid increase in the industrial growth within mainland China, but that came as a consequence. Uh, I mentioned the Yangtze River. It's the longest uh, river in China. Uh, it it uh, runs through central China from the far west side, exiting in Shanghai at the East China Sea. But it also is uh, a major water resource for more than a third of its population. Uh, so it's a, it's a significant resource. And as a consequence of this increase in industrial capability, industrial capacity and output in China, um, there were some environmental uh, damages that were occurring to the uh, Yangtze River. So China's five-year planning has targeted uh, water quality improvements in the Yangtze River. 
And as a consequence, uh, one of the things or two of those components uh, that had to be extracted and removed from the river, from the discharges, discharging to the river, was the organic compounds uh, measured as chemical oxygen demand, COD, and nitrogen compounds measured as ammonia compounds and, and, and uh, organic nitrogen compounds. So, and let's take an example for COD. In the United States, our standards were developed as a consequence of the 1972 Clean Water Act. And so our standards became uh, enforceable in, in and around 1976. And we measure those standards in the form of BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, which is a fraction or subset of the COD. So our equivalent COD, say for oil and gas um, um, discharges, would probably be, if we, had re if we did regulate on COD, would probably be in the order of 150 to 200 milligram per liter uh, COD as an allowable discharge. China, on the other hand, has gone from 100 milligram per liter COD of 15 years ago to 60 milligram per liter, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years ago. And now it's as low as 30 milligram per liter. In this particular case that we're talking about, it's 50 milligram per liter. So highly, highly restrictive uh, when you compare it to the world stage in terms of allowable discharges for these types of wastewaters. But it's a great move into sustainability initiatives. So it's, it's super important, of course, a lot of stuff that's going on around the world today. So yeah, totally applicable, I believe, to most hey, of us. <laughs> yes, and, and that's exactly right. And so we're talking about the 12th and the 13th five-year plan. The five-year plans for China are all about economic growth, agricultural improvement, industrial growth. And the 12th and 13th plans, uh, you know, again, dating back to as early as 1953, but now uh, moving into the uh, 21st century, uh, these plans are addressing environmental improvements. The 15th uh, five-year plan, uh, which is due out in 2021 under development right now, is addressing those same issues that you just pointed out. Uh, the sustainability, the carbon footprint, uh, capping carbon emissions, and so forth. So um, it's it's been a rapid rise for China, but uh, mandated and influenced, of course, by their rapid industrial expansion and the and the you know growing awareness of uh, of sustainability and and current sustainable practices. Absolutely, and I know it's just one of dozens of countries that are doing the exact same thing. So. This technology is easily applicable, I believe, in many countries around the world. Um, so I got one last question for you. Of course, in addition to, to delivering complete technology solutions, so I'm kind of curious, how else do you help customers optimize their operations while still being able to meet those stringent discharge reuse guidelines? Well, you know, it, and that's a great follow-on question because uh, the nature of the work that, of, of Siemens Water Solutions is a little different, somewhat different than maybe what is customary and usual in the United States, but is now mandated you know, on the, on the global stage. So a traditional project might entail a, um, a consulting organization that is um, uh, well-versed in the art and the practice of environmental engineering. So there's a project would entail uh, development of the process design report, the design drawings, um, and the specifications for the project, that's all turned over to the owner, for the owner to, 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 to uh, purchase the equipment and find a contractor, a general contractor to build the infrastructure. And then of course, it's less, left up to the owner and the operator uh, to run and operate that wastewater treatment plant. Um, in, in our uh, 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 environment where, we, where Siemens provides its solutions, it's a little different because Siemens is going to be responsible for that process engineering work as well as the selection, either the fabrication or the outright purchase of the proprietary equipment to make sure that this system performs and behaves as designed. And it's followed up by the performance guarantee. In other words, Siemens doesn't turn it over to the owner and say, you're on your own at this point. And if you have any further questions, call us. Siemens is there with the owner through the construction, 
uh, monitoring the startup, checking out that equipment, uh, making sure that it performs as specified. And if it doesn't, we're there to make sure that the, that the fixes are deployed to, uh, to meet not only the mechanical warranty, but the process performance warranty. And if for some reason something was missed, Siemens, the organization that we are, we're there to, to make sure that the appropriate changes to the process are made to guarantee the adequate performance. So that's through the phase one cycle of, of design, construction supervision and oversight, mechanical completion checkouts, as well as process performance guarantee backed up by a, promise, uh, a process performance test. So we, we set the test protocols, set the uh, requirements, and for uh, a week to 10 days, we're there on site demonstrating, guaranteeing that the process is working as, as designed. Now that is then followed up through the entire life cycle of, of the project with our life cycle management uh, um, you know, uh, systems where we can um, we, we assist with the customer uh, in, in making sure that uh, replacement parts uh, for those parts that are, um, are wear, wearable parts. So we're an organization that has uh, access, global access to parts replacement, equipment replacement, uh, operated training. Uh, many times the wastewater treatment and the water treatment systems are proving grounds for early entry uh, people, young engineers cycling through utility departments. So they're there for a couple of years and then they move on. And so Siemens then deploys its uh, senior expert, wastewater and water treatment experts, and are ready and there for customers uh, to uh, for continuing quality improvement and continuing education. And then lastly, in this digital world that we've all entered into, we're now monitoring data is now digitized. That only means that it's there on, on a spreadsheet or some electronic form and it's placed on a cloud somewhere ready to be downloaded, but now there's the next step. And that's where Siemens is, is uh, providing uh, these types of services to our customers. And that's the digitalization. How do you manage, what do you do with that data? What can you do with the data to improve operations, to uh, control uh, operating costs, energy consumption, chemical utilization? So we're taking that data and creating models that can forecast wastewater treatment uh, needs and requirements. Is there a requirement for additional uh, mechanical equipment to come online? Can we monitor at using surrogates, not the analytical chemistry, but online instrumentation that would be surrogates for the online, uh, for the um, uh, actual chemical uh, laboratory data? And so we compile all that and we transform that into software capable of, of assisting operators in forecasting future wastewater treatment needs, which could either be additional requirements or backing it off a little bit so that they're not overspending in their energy and chemical consumption. So these are the additional follow-up uh, services that uh, follow the project through its entire life cycle. So the full package, you just have to say. <laughs> I guess so. But you know, we have we we you know what is the full package, and and oh, no. <laughs> now and, and certainly now it 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 has evolved into something so much more meaningful in terms of where it really uh, really helps in the operations and uh, throughout the the project life cycle. Absolutely, and and Bill, of course, I really want to thank you uh, sincerely for your time today to discuss this uh, your article in more detail, but more importantly, this the technology that y'all are offering because, like we just kind of spoke about. These environmental regulations, they're only going to get more stringent in time. And we're starting to see that more and more with dozens of countries around the globe. So this kind of technology is going to be incredibly important moving forward. Um, so really want to thank you for, for giving us several minutes to talk to, talk to you about this. Uh, my, my pleasure. And, and to the point where you said global, these installations are, in fact, truly global. So they've gone from the United States into China. They're in the Middle East. Uh, even in South America. So it truly has a global footprint. And as uh, countries around the world are improving their environmental uh, conditions and regulations and looking for more sustainable approaches, you know, Siemens Water Solutions is certainly there to partner with, uh, with our customers achieving their goals. Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Bill, for your time. And of course, we really want to thank all of you for watching the latest installment of Hydrocarbon Processing's Refined View. Thank you.
Thank you.